من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى أهله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters Inshallah today we move on to hadith number 7 Now if, I, if you haven't already caught the drift we are currently going to a chapter the book the section which is about parents and there are 46 ahadith in this entire chapter. We're on hadith number 7 right now. I feel like by the time I reach hadith 46, I will officially be blacklisted by every teenager who's watching this on Instagram Live. So I request once again that inshallah let us not shove this down the throat of our kids because we got enough ammunition that we can kind of quote Quran and Sunnah now to kind of get our point across. It's My teachers have always taught me that if you ever have a family feud, don't bring Quran and Sunnah in the middle. Because when emotions flare up, you don't want to justify your point by bringing Quran and Sunnah in the middle. And God forbid you were wrong at the end. You kind of contaminated the sacredness of Quran and Sunnah because you wanted to make a point. It's dangerous business. Hadith for today. Hadith number seven. Comes from Ibn Abbas where Ibn Abbas says that any Muslim whose both parents are alive and this particular individual, his conduct to his parents is the one where he's obeying Allah by being kind to his parents. Let me put that a little bit more simply. He says any Muslim, both of whose parents are alive and he's obedient to them for Allah's sake, Allah opens two doors of Jannah for this person. And if one parent is alive, then one door of Jannah continues to remain open. And if he irritates one of them, then Allah will not be pleased until the parents are pleased. So, a companion who's hearing this hadith, he says, Messenger of Allah, what if parents were at fault? What if they kind of started this whole thing? You know, the parents overreacted about grades or report card or parents completely flew off the handle. And that's what kind of annoyed the child and then he talked back and he irritated the parents. That's a fair question. What if parents were kind of at fault here and then the child irritated them? The Prophet said, still then, the person who has to eat the humble pie are the children. They have to kind of still make sure that at the end of the night before they go to sleep, the parents are still pleased with them before they call it a night. Now, Two academic points about this hadith and then the lesson that I like to share with you. First, notice this is not a hadith because Ibn Abbas is the one who's talking. I just gave you a quote of Ibn Abbas However, here's something interesting that you want to, I don't know if you were able to pick up on. There's a rule in Islamic sciences, particularly the science of hadith, is that when a Sahabi makes a statement about the unseen, or he starts talking about the reward of a deed, a knowledge that could only come through revelation, then even though they don't mention the Prophet said this, it automatically gets an upgrade. Because how did a Sahabi know something about the unseen unless it came from the Prophet? How did he know a reward of a deed unless it came from the Prophet So even though Ibn Abbas here doesn't say the Prophet said it, it's kind of understood. It's kind of understood that he's getting it from the Prophet Now here's the second thing. This hadith in the chain of transmission has a little bit of weakness. There's one narrator, his name is Sa'id al-Qaisi. We just don't know anything in the biographical sources about this person's credentials, his reliability, his character. Therefore, this hadith is not that strong. And this leads me to the third point. Here are some scholars, they say, even if a hadith, hadith is weak, it is permissible to use the hadith for what we call fadail al-a'mal. If you're trying to motivate yourself or someone else to do an act that is already established through other more authentic hadith, you can use a somewhat weak hadith to motivate yourself to do an already an already established act. Does that make sense? So prayer is already established. Now, a weak hadith can come and motivate you to further incite you to do that act. Respect for parents is already established. This, is, this hadith is like, kind of like, salt in the food. Or this is as we say in the, in the AC world, this is like the orange dye on the biryani. Biryani is already taken care of. This is not just, you're adding a little condiment on the top. This is the opinion of many scholars. Imam Nawawi, 
This is the opinion of Imam Ahmad ibn Taqiq al that you can use weak ahadith for fadail al amal This is why Imam Bukhari brings it here. Now that I'm done with the academic discussion, the main lesson to walk away from, my dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to this hadith, is that your parents truly are your shortcut to Jannah. This is pure and simple. That your parents, if they're alive, they're truly your shortcut to Jannah and rightfully so. Because I don't care what anyone says, no one will love you the way your parents do. You know, you'll have different friends at different points in your life, but like the actors on stage, they will continue to change. One thing that will remain a constant is the love of your parents. I'll give you a small example, something that happened to me personally. When I was moving from Dallas to Chicago, I decided to drive down, 16 hour drive in my SUV. When my uh, mom found out that I'm driving, she's like, well, you're not driving alone because I don't trust you on the road. So she chose to drive with me and my sister all the way from Dallas to Chicago. Interestingly enough, we took our first stop in Memphis. And when we took a break, we went out to eat, you know, you know, we were hungry, we wanted to catch some dinner. What happened is that I was just recovering from a cold, and I have this issue that whenever I'm recovering from a cold, I lose all taste. So we go out to eat dinner, I practically can't, cannot taste a thing. And now the food is ordered, and it's one of the best restaurants in the area. My sister and my mom, they're both enjoying it, but they feel, they're feeling so bad that I can't taste a thing. Anyway, the night is over. Next morning, we hit the road again, and now the next stop is Chicago. Now, at this time, my sister drives, my mom is riding shotgun, I'm in the back seat sleeping. And I just knock out completely, and by the time I wake up, it's already Chicago. And subhanAllah, I can feel now that my taste is back, and I'm really excited about the next meal. And my sister tells me, you know, last two hours, I saw, my, I saw our mom praying constantly and blowing over you hoping that your taste will come back so that you can enjoy your next meal. Who does that? Who can, in a world as selfish as ours, who even remembers and cares? Except your parents. And you know what this, what my mom just did right now? Pales in comparison to what she must have gone through for me when she was in that room giving birth to me. I tell you, I was in the room when my wife was starting to experience the pains of labor. And Allah Adim, I'm a grown man. And when the pains kicked in and epidural had not, the, the pain was so excruciating that she had to scream just to cope with that pain. And I am watching this and I am literally crying like a baby, seeing the pain that she's going through. And then, it only then and then I understood that my mom had to go through with this for about 13 hours, 14 hours without epidural. And I was, honestly, when the baby, alhamdulillah, was a completely healthy birth, I called my mom, like, how did you go through this? So when you see the screams of your own wife, what they have to go through to give birth, then you understand how obnoxious it is when you hear a child scream at their parents. Only then it hits you, subhanAllah. And then it doesn't get easy for them. The stretch marks, the, the hair loss, the body is not the same, round the clock word. You, the way your parents love you, no one comes close. My teacher Mufti Kamani, when his mother passed away, he, uh, of course, he was devastated. He said, my teacher called me after my mother passed away and then Janazah occurred. And he said, my teacher called me and obviously offered his condolences and told me how bad he felt. And then he said, my teacher told me that Hussein, this is the first name of my teacher. He said, my teacher said, Hussein, be careful now and watch your tracks, watch your back. Hussein said, why? And my teacher Mufti Kamai said, why? He said, because now there's no one with their head down in the ground making dua for you. Now when you trip and you make a sin, you don't have somebody tearing up for you, making dua for you. You don't have the shade of the dua of your mother protecting you anymore. You be careful out there now. You don't have the spiritual shield you used to have with your mother constantly invoking Allah for you. And recently, I lost my grandma. Two days ago, we got the news. Sorry, I'm overloading you with all this. But this is the final thing. We recently received the news that my nani, my grandma passed away. And uh, of course, my mom was devastated. 
when she found out. And so we're all tearing up. And um, what really hit all of us deep is that my mom, this was her second parent that she was. Both doors of Jannah are closed. And now what's there to go back to Pakistan for? Your parents are gone. What's there to look forward to? All you have left to do is now to see and visit the grave of your parents. So if you have these two doors open, please take advantage. And please make sure that you are able to really capitalize on the opportunity that Allah has given you. Subhanahu wa rabbika rabbil izzati amma yisafu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.